we start recording recording now as well just started the recording chat thank you very much uh, welcome to the scrutiny program committee i'm going to start off with apologies for absence and then i'm going to ask kate to go through a roll call so people can indicate that they are um, they're, they're present or not well obviously they're not if they're not here they're not going to say anything so do we have any apologies for absence um bridge i think we've had one haven't we councillor gloria tanner has tendered apologies chair OK, thank you. Kate, would you like to go through a roll call? Um, make sure to check you're on mute or not before when, when, when you call, when she calls your name. OK, Kate, sorry. There we go. Um, just clarify down the chair, Councillor Peter Black, are we here? I'm, I'm present. <laughs> Councillor Cyril Anderson. Present. Councillor Wendy Fitzgerald. She's muted. Councillor Wendy Fitzgerald, are you present? Thank you. Councillor sorry, sorry, I did switch off my mute. <laughs> That's OK, thank you. Councillor Louise Gibbard, present? Yes, present. Did you hear me? Yeah, we've got you. Louise, oh, yeah. sorry. Hmm. Councillor Joe Hale? Yeah, yeah. Councillor David Halliwell. Present. Councillor Terry Hennigan. <coughs> Councillor Hennigan. No, that's him for Councillor Hennigan. Councillor Peter Jones. Uh, present. Councillor Erica Kirshner. Present. Councillor Wendy Lewis. Present. Councillor Will Thomas. Present. Councillor Mike White. Present. Co-opted members, David Anderson Thomas. Present. Thank you. Alexander Roberts. Present. Okay, Councillor Co-optees, Councillor Chris Holly. Present. Councillor Paxton Hood-Williams. Present. Councillor Lyndon Jones. Present. Councillor Jeff Jones. Present. Okay, on to invited members and officers. The leader, Councillor Rob Stewart. Present. Thank you. Chief Executive Phil Robert. Present. Thank you. Deputy Chief Executive Adam Hill. Do we have Adam Hill? I don't think Adam's here, no. Okay. Uh, Director of Place, Martin Nichols. Present. Thank you. Okay, support officers we have Bridge Madaha. Present. Thank you. And then in the Guild Hall, we have myself, Kate Jones, Democratic Services Officer. Debbie Smith, Legal Advisor. We have Darren Richards from IT supporting the live event and Scott Dummett from Legal watching the live event as well. That's lovely. Thank you, Kay. Thank you for that, everyone. Uh, right, so the next item on the agenda is prohibition of whipped votes and declaration of party whips. Does anybody have anything to say into that particular item? No, thank you. And so the minutes of the, of the last meeting, um, on I'm going to take for information on page one, page two, and page three. Can we accept those on an accurate record of the minutes? I take your silence as assent. Thank you very much. Um, public question time. Do we have any public questions being sent in, Bridge? None, Chair. No, no public questions received. In that case, I'm going to invite the leader and the chief executive to um, introduce the, uh, the next item, which is the update on COVID-19, unless if that's OK. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> We've got a, a short number of slides we, which we can work through, but I think they may address some of your questions that um, uh, Bridge has shared with us. Um, but again, if there's anything that isn't in the presentation, feel free to um, obviously uh, ask us after the presentation. So that, those are the areas that we we were wanting to cover for you today. Uh, these are the follow up, obviously, to the initial discussion that we had last week. So, um, Phil, if we can go on to the first uh, slide 
So again, just an update there. Uh, largely, as we reported uh, previously, we've got um, an average of 519.9 cases per 100,000 population, which again leaves us in uh, one of the lowest rates of positive cases in the country. Um, 1,284 cases have been confirmed as positive across all settings and 233 people have confirmed to have died from COVID-19. 11.3% um, of the tests uh, are found to be positive, again, lower than other population centres. And uh, to date, or uh, as of the creation of this slide, 11,376 tests have been uh, delivered <coughs> uh, at the Liberty Stadium and in other settings. Um, in terms of the Bayfield Hospital, we've had um, just short of 12,000 antibody tests undertaken. Um, and that was as of uh, the 3rd of uh, July. And mobile testing units for care homes have been established and are working positively at the present time. So, again, good progress there. I, I know you were uh, interested as well. The committee was interested in terms of decisions that we would have made uh, during the early stages of lockdown, key decisions. So the list is there. I'm happy to run through them quickly. So um, obviously, decision to close certain offices and services uh, to the public um, at the outbreak of the uh, virus and uh, as lockdown came in. Obviously, within that, we had decisions to close libraries, public uh, sorry, playgrounds and cultural venues. The key decision to build a field hospital obviously was one that was taken. Uh, decision to change the social care offer. That was obviously something that uh, we did uh, very publicly in, in this area in terms of making sure that we limited the amount of um, social care um, interaction, especially in people's own homes. So um, that was a, a key uh, change that we made in this area. Decisions, obviously, to open uh, additional residential care settings in Sketi and Gosainan, and those are still available to us. Um, decisions on the mortuary provision, body storage and transportation. And again, these were part of a national effort to prepare, prepare if obviously we, we, did, we weren't able to avoid that significant um, first wave as proposed in the early days of the, the COVID planning. Um, obviously, we, we made uh, decisions to procure and administer PPE. Uh, and as I said in our previous meeting, I won't repeat the whole detail, but you know that Swansea took a leading role to make sure that we were never without PPE for any of our settings. Um, decision to operate a specific number of childcare settings. These were around 60 odd locations across our schools estate. Uh, to look after uh, children in, especially of emergency care workers and frontline workers. Uh, a decision uh, on the options of delivery of free school meals. So these move from being a uh, grab and go bag to being food box delivery, and then obviously morphing later on into the provision of free school meals payments. Uh, a decision to operate the shielding system uh, for the vulnerable and, and to redeploy staff into services to do that. And again, I gave the figures at the last meeting in terms of the numbers of people we were still uh, supporting in the shielding system. Uh, obviously, the establishment of the Test, Trace, Protect programme. Uh, and again, we've redeployed staff into that, and I can give you an update in the coming slides in terms of where we are with that at the present time. Um, <clears throat> obviously, uh, to decision to reopen schools uh, for three weeks rather than for four. Um, in the absence of uh, clarity uh, and an agreement from all parties, um, we made the decision to give uh, three weeks as the period rather than four so that schools had um, confidence and clarity on which to plan. In terms of, uh, you know, obviously uh, proactive actions, we engaged with the management of Debenhams uh, and made a decision on discretionary discounts. Um, uh, we've also made decisions on the market and also Freedom Leisure to make sure that those organisations are supported to survive uh, the COVID crisis. Um, we are now making decisions on the return of services and all returns of services are done uh, via a risk assessment uh, in collaboration with the trade unions uh, on the basis, obviously, to what we want to make sure that if people are coming back to work, they're doing so in a safe manner. We could, took a decision to freeze uh, car parking charges and obviously um, city centre locations have benefited from free parking charges in council car parks for some time. And obviously, uh, we've dealt with a num number of employment policy issues, um, which we have uh, taken. Uh, I would say in terms of all of the decisions, where it, wherever possible, uh, I have tried to consult group leaders uh, about them. And we would have, we had, uh, as I'm sure the group leaders uh, on the committee will, will uh, testify, 
had regular briefings uh, for group leaders, giving them with uh, you know a great deal of clarity and information about the decisions we were taking as an administration or as a as an ex executive group um, during the the early days of the crisis. Uh, in terms of the test trace protect program, I mean we got more information to give you. Uh, uh, subject to questions, obviously, um, but the teams are in place and have been trained. The light, the system is is, is working well. Numbers are very low at the moment, um, but we are helping using our our resources to help areas where they have had um, more infections of later, including North Wales. So again, we, we've ramped up. We haven't needed to recruit extra staff at this point in time, but we still retain the option to do so should we need that in future weeks. But at the moment, figures are very low. Uh, again, I won't say too much about this, but uh, the recovery planning, uh, we, we're around uh, the same stage as most councils across Wales at the moment. Obviously, there's a lot of the recovery plan that is already being deployed. So, you know, we, we, we're into the safe opening of schools. We're looking at the, the revised provision for social care going forward. We're assisting businesses across the city to reopen safely. Um, so there is a lot of recovery planning that's already going on, and, and that is live at the present time. Um, but of course, we are taking a strategic view about what we can carry forward that we've learned out of uh, uh, the COVID crisis, those good things. Obviously, remote working is one of them. We're all doing that at the moment every day. We don't want to lose that, but we do need to make sure that we balance it properly in terms of, uh, of how staff uh, use that technology going forward. Um, obviously, uh, again, the themes are laid out there, so it's covering all of the areas that you would expect us to look at in terms of making sure that the plan addresses each of them. But a lot of these, as you already know, are, are already into uh, the restart, the restart phases as, as those services come back online. OK, current challenges, um, obviously, um, you know, we, we say it all the time. Uh, I think we've been, uh, you know, the public have responded really well in the area. You know, people have by, by and large subject to some issues that which we've seen in the press recently, by and large obeyed the lockdown. We've avoided that potential, uh, you know, huge amount of deaths that were originally in the in the government's original figures. And, uh, you know, we've we've prepared well, but we aren't out of the woods yet. The, the virus is still very much with us and there is a potential for a second peak or future peaks or second wave coming forward in, in the coming months over the winter period. So we have to remain really vigilant. Um, obviously, returning services is, is proving really challenging. As I said in our previous meeting, you know, shutting something or closing something down is very much simpler than it is to restart it up, especially if you're starting it up with COVID still active in the community. So um, there's a huge amount of work going on across the whole council as we restart services. And of course, one of the challenges, many of our staff, 300 or so of our staff, are redeployed into new services that we weren't running previously. Um, so again, we have to manage that process properly as we bring our existing services back online. We then have to think about how we bring the staff back from the redeployed services. We're well into the planning. We had a very positive meeting with heads today around schools uh, reopening in September. The proposal for that is uh, that we would obviously begin the opening on uh, September the 1st with a phased return to, to schools uh, for pupils over the two week period with everybody being back in then uh, from the week of the 14th. Um, schools will have uh, a degree of flexibility as to how they do that, but the principles that we went through today with the heads have all been agreed and uh, that gives them confidence on which to plan now the, the reopening that suits their school setting best. Uh, obviously that school uh, reopening will extend to things like transport, catering and all of the other support services that are needed. So it, again, it's a very complex uh, process that we're having to go through to make sure that people uh, stay safe when we reopen schools fully in September. Um, I mentioned restarting the economy. There's a huge amount of work going on uh, again uh, through the licensing team, the planning team, um, as well as through economic development to look at how we can support businesses to reopen safely. Um, you know, the, the first minister is very clear about this regular repeating rhythm uh, where they make announcements every week. And obviously that means that things change quite regularly every week. So we have to be very uh, proactive and we have to think ahead and plan ahead uh, so that we have the right things in place to support uh, the businesses in our area uh, as best we can as they reopen. 
Um, obviously, for us internally, we'll be continuing the, the transformation, you know, the journey that we have in terms of making sure we manage the budget, transform services, modernize services has not ceased. You know, that has to continue. But we will build into that transformation program um, the learnings that we've had from COVID. And again, we will be announcing a, a replacement for sustainable Swansea fit for the future in the coming months, which will take us on the next phase of that journey. So, uh, again, work is going on on that at the present time. <clears throat> Obviously, as we get into a more normal mode of operation and as more services come back online, we'll return to the conventional governance processes. So, you know, as soon as we're able to and as soon as it's safe to do so, you know, we, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to, you know, committee meetings and council meetings in the Guild Hall. But for now, we'll do what we can via the technology that we have. But it's moving to that more normal phase of operation. And then obviously, financial planning is hugely important. We are submitting claims all the time uh, with Welsh Government in terms of recovering uh, lost income and other things that we can claim against the COVID fund. And again, we're in discussions with Welsh Government to make sure that they are able then to approve those. Um, and uh, as are all councils at the moment with Welsh Government to make sure that that money is um, uh, provided back to us in the way that it was promised. And that was a very quick run through, Chair, um, but I know you, you've submitted uh, and I'm grateful for that, uh, a number of questions. So over to you and obviously we'll do our best to answer them. Thank you very much, Rob. That's very helpful indeed. Um, I'm going to take this um, section by section if, to try to get some structure to the to the, um, to the way we deal with this. So the first part is um, the current position in terms of local public health. I think Paxton had a question on that, which may or may not have been dealt with in the presentation. And after him, I think Terry wants to come in on that as well. Paxton, do you want to ask your question? Yes, OK, thank you, Chairman. I appreciate that. Um, obviously, the leader and in the statement, which has been very interesting and very informative, and I'm grateful to him for that, um, has already mentioned about the TTP process and that being in place, working effectively. Um, the other question I was going to ask in this area was, in fact, in terms of how much detailed information you're getting in terms of the incidence of the virus locally in down to postcode levels or street levels or whatever because obviously you said it's relatively low in Swansea so I'd be interested to know how that is and how it's tying in with the TTP process and a slightly different question then um, obviously uh, <coughs> we can open community centres now from uh, next Monday I think it is on the 20th um, Certainly, those of us who've got community councils might well have community centres around. I'm just wondering what the, what the thinking is in terms of the city council in terms of opening those up and what process they're going to adopt for it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair. I'll do my best to pick up those points. But um, on the, um, if I miss anything, I'm sure uh, Mr. Nichols or Phil will come in. Um, at the time, I had the most up to date information. At present, we have 14 uh, suspected cases uh, of cor coronavirus in our hospitals in the area and three confirmed cases. Um, again, in terms of the laboratory tests, I've, I've given you the figures for those earlier. Just in terms of the test trace protect program, as I said, it's extremely small numbers at the moment. So we're talking in the low um, 10, 20, 30 uh, uh, tests, uh, uh, people being referred per day. Um, and as I said, we're using some of our spare capacity to help other areas. Um, there is no significant uh, peak or, or, or focus in terms of an outbreak in an area, but obviously we remain vigilant. And if, as the opening up arrangements uh, and the onset of tourists and all those other things that potentially could raise the R rate a bit or could uh, lead to some outbreaks, then obviously our TTP programme will focus on that and take the necessary action. Um, just in terms of antigen de and antibody tests, as I said, um, 16,000 antigen tests have been done uh, and 12,000 antibody tests have been undertaken. Um, care home testing, just, uh, just so you're aware of that one. Uh, again, in terms of the testing for care homes, we've done every care home, that's every patient, every member of staff, and we're now repeating that on a regular basis. So um, all of that uh, was done ahead of schedule and continues. In terms of the community centres, um, what we're trying to do um, is uh, our environmental health team, Mark Wade's team, are, are there to help uh, advise businesses and uh, community centres how best to reopen. There is guidance that we can offer on that. Again, as, as you pointed out, not all of the community centres are in direct uh, ownership or control of the, of the city council. 
but where we can provide help, guidance and assistance, we will do so. UK Paxton, I think you want to add to that? Uh, no, just to say thank you very much for that. Um, I did mute myself okay. for a moment, so I had to unmute myself very quickly. Anyway, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Martin Nichols, did you want to add to that, add to that answer? Uh, if I may, thank you, Chair. Just, just briefly, just, just for the month of June, to give you an indication, uh, there were 26 uh, index cases, as it's called, coming through the TTP programme. So the leader was was right in his, in his tens. Um, the, that has that continued throughout July. I don't have the accumulated totals for July yet, but 26 positive cases, and that led to 61 contacts needing to be traced. So quite low numbers of contacts coming from each index case. Very similar numbers within Neath Patal, but you'd be aware that elsewhere in Wales there have been some some quite significant spikes. Um, but at the moment, the, the levels within Swansea are uh, are very low, and that's uh, and that's good news. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Terry Hennigan. Yes, uh, for the leader, um, saying about what's being opened and what's not being opened, are the district housing offices open at the moment or do we have a plan for them to open? So at the present time, the services are open, Terry, but I don't think the physical locations are open as such. And again, um, we'll only open them when it's safe to do so. And again, housing will be looking at a reopening programme for that. So uh, Martin and the team go through every week with the trade unions and look at the areas of services that need to reopen. Obviously, our focus in housing has been uh, re-engaging re on those um, repairs where people had started the re uh, you know, a, a refurbishment before um, COVID and, and then were left, unfortunately, with a part completed property. So again, we've been bringing people back in in recent weeks to cont continue with that work. Obviously, we never stopped emergency repairs, but oh. again, housing are re-engaging re their services at the moment. But I don't know whether Martin's got a date for housing offices. I don't think we have one at present. No. no. Okay. So Terry, uh, Jeff yeah. Jones. Yeah, I didn't know whether to actually come in at this, at this point. Um, Rob, in your presentation, you actually mentioned finance, and you know, unfortunately, or fortunately, it is a very important part of any uh, scheme. Um, I could see this week, you know, in the paper, we, uh, I think you actually said we were 18 million better off. Um, a lot of that, I'm assuming, is the money that we outlaid for the hospital that's actually come back. No, actually, we've had the, the, the full amount back for the hospital, which is really good news. And uh, I, I did say that last time we were expecting it, and it has come through. So yeah. uh, both myself, Ben, and everybody else is very happy that that money has arrived in our bank accounts. No, the 18 million, if you remember, at the beginning of the year, we were expecting to have a significant uh, overspend. Mm -hmm. um, what we've ended up with with a significant underspend. So that 18 million pounds mm -hmm. is a... Uh, an underspend against the projected services, uh, projected outturn. So that's the outturn report, which will make its way, obviously, to uh, mm -hmm. to cabinet and stuff in in due course. So yes, yeah, it's, it's a much improved position. And again, my thanks go to the cabinet members and the officers who work to deliver that um, better than expected budget outturn. Yeah, good. Okay, that's that's really good news. With the, with regards to you know COVID, you actually mentioned that I think costs are tracked by codes and so on. Can you give some sort of indication with regards to how much um, has been outlaid at the present time? And you also mentioned um, uh, you know, the cost, some of the costs that we can actually get back. So, you know, does it mean that we won't get all the costs back? And, you know, is there some sort of guesstimate with regards to the proportion of costs we perhaps won't get back at the end of the day? OK, so it's a really complex picture on that one, but uh, I'll repeat what I said at the previous uh, scrutiny session. Uh, and I think Mr. Smith, uh, I don't know whether Mr. Smith's on the call today, but um, Mr. Smith was clear as well in, in his presentation uh, uh, to Cabinet that, um, you know, we've had to flex the budget by over 100 million. And that's mm -hmm. variances in the budget, not just a, an extra spend, yeah. but variances flex of 100 million yeah. and obviously 15 million in capital which was the, the money that was obviously provided in to, to get the hospital bill done. Yeah. Um, in terms of the reclaiming some of that off Welsh Government, some of it will be coming through in grants, which we've now had confirmed. Right. So we won't have to bid for some of that money. Uh, and that's that will have arrived with us. And there's a few of those that we've, we've been able to confirm and bank. Then there is obviously the other part of it, which is around an underwrite for lost income. 
uh, and also other support that might be available. So we know, again, we've had grants for businesses, which we put out uh, money going out for business rates, which has gone out uh, to the businesses. But then there is things like car parking income, uh, mm -hmm. and other income that we would otherwise have got, which we've not been able to get, obviously, because our facilities are closed. Yeah. So at the moment, Ben and the team have submitted a number of claims, which all councils have, have been asked to do. They are claims on actuals uh, against what we think we've lost. Mm -hmm. There is a process then where you go through a review with Welsh government officials, and then they either uh, accept or reject um, your claims that you put in. Um, I know across the border in England, where the government's have been doing this for councils, they've been making a different assumption in terms of perhaps you cover the first so many percent yourself, mm -hmm. and then they pay you a percentage of what's left. Mm -hmm. um, we're not in that game at the moment with Welsh government. So again, we're continuing to, to go through the process, but I guess until we get to the end of the year, we won't know exactly what we've had back compared to what we'd uh, expected. The other point I should make, of course, some of our other lost income at the moment is not really lost. It's deferred income. So where we've given perhaps council taxpayers um, a few extra months to to get their payments in order. Again, we would expect to recover that, but just later in the year. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks. I think, Rob, as well, there was a newspaper. So, Rob, you, you muted again. Um, there was a newspaper article um, only, I think, earlier this week where some of the English councils had invested large amounts of money into commercial property to boost their own income. I don't think we've done that here, though. We have invested, for example, I think, in multi-storey car parks. Um, is, is there a shortfall in projected income from those sorts of investments which we're having to cover? No, not, not in that extent, because what we've what we've uh, done, obviously, we've um, acquired buildings, but we um, I think Swansea is probably one of the uh, largest uh, 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 asset owners in in Wales uh, as a city yeah. uh, because obviously we have a history uh, which is unique to Swansea which is where obviously the city was rebuilt and uh, obviously we had a lot of ownership in that so there is a there is a I guess a, a an extra exposure aspect for Swansea as opposed to other councils but we would be making the case and we are making the case to Welsh government that that should be part of what's covered we, we okay. have invested outside our borders, as you know, uh, Peter, that which is what yeah. a lot of English councils have done. OK, Chief Executive, wish to come in? Yes, thanks, Council. That was a very, uh, if I may say so, a very topical and current uh, point that you just made. Uh, and um, I think for those councils like Luton and Manchester, for example, who've either inherited or invested significantly in things like airports, there is a huge challenge. I think, as the leaders said, the only thing that's slightly unusual about Swansea is property ownership in the city centre is higher than you might normally expect. And that was as a consequence of um, the then council having to rebuild the city after the three nights blitz. So we do have uh, significant property ownerships, but of course that's on the list amongst lots of other things uh, to be discussed with Welsh Government on income. And the general point is this will take time. I know it's it's not the best for Mr. Smith's blood pressure. He's got every confidence that we'll actually get there, but it has to be audited. We have to accept that there has got to be a proper process for the audit and treatment of any claims by councils, because uh, there's a, a need for everyone to be treated fairly and equally in the whole process. But I do, uh, I do understand that in England, uh, uh, Chair, it has caused some significant concerns in terms of some councils. Is, is there an ongoing process, Phil, or is there a deadline by which we need to get these claims in? There are a series of deadlines, Chair, uh, but it will be an ongoing process. Now, part of it, uh, we have assurance up front about. So for test, trace and protect, we've been given an indicative amount uh, which matches the amount that we've indicated we will be likely to spend by March. But other things, like income, for example, have to be assessed on a month-by-month -month basis. Mr Smith fills in his returns diligently and, and uh, scrupulously and I am confident that the coding system will be accurate and auditable uh, going forward but the claims differ depending on what the nature of the particular issue is Chair. Uh, and is there an indication from Welsh Government as to whether or not they, are, they have the sort of resources to meet these claims? We've had no direct indications uh, of course <laughs> But what we have been very clear about is how much it's cost in local government. There is a degree to which we've uh, actually redeployed and used our own resources, and we have to accept that. And there are some choices and decisions that are made locally outside of the national framework, which need to be funded locally, potentially. Uh, 
But, you know, I think everyone's found themselves in a very unusual position here, including Welsh Government. I have some sympathies with them um, because, we, you know, we are incurring at a national level, as you've heard some eye-watering figures in England, a significant amount of expenditure. And, of course, local government is going to be very clear. I've just come off a call with the other, all the other councils, very clear about its expectations uh, in relation to that, because what we've primarily done is implement Welsh Government policy on the ground. OK. Uh, Chris Holly. Th thank you, Chair. Just just to clear up a couple of things, the the surplus that we've had this, this year, if I'm right, Rob, is made up of a £5 million um, one-off payment from the NHS for bills that we accrued, accrued over the last, I don't know, 10 years or so. £7 million underspend uh, and the contingency fund underspend of £6 million, which makes up the £18 million, which I have to say is a bit of a surprise, to say the least. But uh, And the other thing is that the uh, a question I want to ask is, well, on one of your slides, um, you mentioned support for Swansea Market and for Freedom Leisure. Uh, I have no problem with the market because I think that, you know, is probably the, the jewel in Swansea's crown. And I think we should encourage that, that as much as we possibly can. The thing is, is Freedom Leisure going to set a precedent for other, comp other firms coming up and saying, yeah, we've lost money as well. Uh, are you prepared to, to you know, to, to subsidise us as well? I know that we are giving rich relief. I know we're giving money from Welsh Government as well through the hard, uh, business hardship. But couldn't Freedom Leisure pick any of that money up and uh, from the, the UK Government and the Welsh Government? And the other question is about the furloughed um, people within Freedom Leisure uh, how are they being paid? Are they being paid by Freedom Leisure or have we got any input into that? Yeah, thanks, Chris. I mean, um, if I deal with the Freedom Leisure bit first, I mean, the, the point here is obviously it's a new arrangement which saves the taxpayer a significant amount of money because obviously the new business model is a lot cheaper to run than the previous uh, in-house model. So that as part of the approval, there was a saving ongoing there. Um, and obviously, if Freedom weren't running those leisure centres for us, we'd be running them at a uh, at a more costly rate. Um, in terms of our principal, though, um, many of those people with Freedom Leisure were, up until recently, council staff. So they had recently transferred. It was important as part of our principle of trying to ensure that nobody loses out during the COVID period, that um, if they furloughed the staff at 80%, we then added some additional assistance so that the staff got the full benefit of the 100% the uh, during the closure period. Obviously, some other uh, aspects of the arrangements, which are uh, contractual, we, we would cover anyway. Uh, but I think what we've come to is a deal which ensures, as best we can, that freedom is stable uh, long term so that they can continue to run our um, uh, leisure centres for us uh, and provide the services that they've contracted to do. Because obviously, as I say, if they weren't able to do that, we don't have to look at, a, again, either a, a different provider or an in-house model, which would be, again, a more costly uh, outcome for the taxpayer. Um, Chris, sorry, you remind me of your previous question. What was the previous one? Uh, about the uh, contingency fund and the, the fact that, as I say, the market, I haven't got a problem with subsidising the market because at the end of the day, that, that's our property and, and, and a direct income for us from the stalls, which I, I know yeah. has had a real issue there. No, the, I was on about the contingency fund at six million, uh, the underspend on capital of seven, and the um, five million one-off payment from the NHS. That just yep. to confirm that, that that's how it's the 18 million is made up. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, the um, as you know, um, we've been negotiating with the health board for some unpaid bills for some time, and, and that was a really good piece of work by Dave Howes and the team there to get that resolved. Um, and again, the other two pots, as you say, make up the uh, the benefit of the giving us a, a nice £18 million cushion to, to deal with COVID, really, because uh, uh, a lot of other councils who didn't have the benefit of coming out with a healthy balance book, obviously, you're going to find a very challenging year. But given that we've had that underspend on the capital and the contingency fund hasn't been touched, how has that affected our service delivery 
um, because obviously with the day centres being closed and, and various other facilities being closed, the contingency fund hasn't been touched because we didn't need to uh, underpin anything. So I'm assuming that once we get back and this, I'll, I'll ask about the recovery later, I think, so I'll leave it for now. Yeah, just on the, on the contingency fund, Chris, you are right. We didn't uh, need to use it last year, which is a good position because obviously that's um, it's there only to be drawn on it for certain purposes. And again, we, we I know we put a series of measures in early in the year to try and prevent um, uh, unnecessary draws on the contingency fund. There were a series of measures that we took early days to make sure the budgets uh, for the directorates were brought back into line. Um, in the in the planning as well, we had planned to replenish that uh, contingency fund. So again, we would have been looking at finding six million to put back into that contingency fund had we utilised it last year. So again, it's an even more healthy picture than the eighteen million even would suggest. Sorry, Chair, you're, you're muted. I'm muted, yes, you're right. <laughs> um, Paxton Hutchwain, she wants to come in? Just to come back in for a minute, uh, Chairman, if I may. Obviously, yeah. the 18 million they're talking about, I assume, is the surplus on the outturn last year. Yes. Um, so there would have been minimal impact as far as COVID is concerned in that respect. How much do you think is going to charge us this year? How much impact is it going to have on the budget in terms of making sure that we get a, at least a balanced budget and not an overspend on the budget in this year? I think it's a question then, yeah. of no, Paxton, I think you're right on that. I mean, uh, what, what I did, what I said in my response to, to Chris was that um, given that we've been able to achieve a healthy outturn report, it's placed us in a better position than a lot of councils to be able to respond to COVID um, because a lot of those costs, as you quite rightly say, will come in the coming year. So it's a, it's a helpful start here because if we'd have been going into the year in a much different position, obviously much more challenging. I, I repeat what I said, our um, our aims and ambitions and our position is that we expect the majority of our costs to be covered by Welsh Government and by UK Government in terms of the programmes that have been made available. There will inevitably be some elements that will fall to the Council, as, as the Chief Executive said, but our, and again, Mr Smith remains confident of this, that what he's seeing, what we're putting uh, in terms of uh, requests to Government, we should get the majority of that covered. OK, um, before we move on to the test, trace and protect program, I just wanted to raise a couple of issues which are being raised with me um, and which are, I know are problematic. Um, constituents continue to ask when we're going to be able to continue to take black bags to the to the um, um, refuse um, centres again and also about the reopening of libraries. I know they're very problematic, both of them. I'm just wondering if we have any plans on those particular issues. So on the um, black bags, the reason we haven't uh, reopened the black bags is, of course, it's not a black bag deposit service. It's a black bag sorting service. And the one thing that we will not um, uh, do until it's safe is allow for that nice. self-sorting to take place at our recycling centres. Again, I know people think that there used to be a service to drop black bags at the recycling centres before COVID. It wasn't. It was You could only take them there and we would sort them with you or would ask you to sort them. So again, it's, it's only that service that would come back and only when it's safe to do so, because obviously there's a risk there of potentially contaminated materials containing COVID and we wouldn't want to put either the public or our staff at risk of that. Um, and on secondly, on libraries, I know it's in the thinking for Welsh Government in terms of um, some of the future openings. Again, once Welsh Government advised that, we look to reopen our libraries. However, it has to be done in, in terms of the redeployment of staff, because a lot of our library staff at the moment are out in the community supporting the shielding programme or supporting other community services. So again, you can't ask people to run two services at once. So we will need to have a managed process whereby we bring them back from the services. Now, again, I think much of that will depend what the government decides to do in terms of shielding support after the 16th of August. Um, at the moment, as you know, we're providing shielding up to that date and we await further information from the chief medical officer, I think is making a statement tomorrow. Uh, in terms of what is likely to happen for shielding post the 16th of August. Thank you for that, Rob. OK, so going to move on to test, trace and protect. And I know, Paxton, you wanted to start off with a question on this? Yeah, I think you're muted, Paxton. Yeah. Sorry, Chairman. I, I, to be fair, I think uh, the leader's already spoken about this. I did mention it or originally earlier okay. in my question, but I think he dealt with it and said, the figures have been very low, and Martin has said it as well through June, uh, through June, and looking like the same in July. I think. 
Okay, Lyndon, did you want to come in? You've got a question, Lyndon Jones. Great, Th thank you, Chair. Um, I think Rob answered the question about the okay. uh, version of testing in care homes. The only thing I would say is that I read this week that um, the staff, um, the testing of staff is under review and that has been stopped. I don't know if that's the case, because if, and if it is, it obviously is, is concerning, because I think about a third of the, the deaths throughout Wales actually were in care homes. So it is obviously quite important. Yeah, Lyndon, I think um, I think uh, the two things have become mixed there a little bit. Um, so there's certainly a review in terms of ongoing testing and, and I, I think around the regularity and how it uh, how it happens, etc. Um, but look, um, you know, from from our local position, we, we've always been uh, advocates and very strong advocates of regular testing uh, in care homes. We've completed that at the moment. Testing is continuing in our areas is across Wales. It hasn't stopped. Um, and again, we are advocating for that to continue. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, on, on that, Rob, we're doing this in house, of course, um, and uh, in contrast to England. Um, how many staff are are involved? What sort of period, and what's the impact on services in actually committing staff to this program over over a period of time? Uh, do you mean test, trace, protect now, or yeah, the test, trace, care? and protect, test, trace, yeah. and protect, yeah. So at the, at the moment, it, it's a it's a small impact. Um, we have um, four teams uh, of people at the moment active. We've we've been able to manage um, with that with reduced hours, given the low numbers that are coming through. I think the point is, if we see an upsurge in the infection rate and then more people be needing to be traced, um, obviously we can expand to eight teams. Um, we can obviously then. Uh, depending on what services we have to run, because of course these are redeployed staff again, so this is about managing the people that we have. Um, we will need to recruit, and again, we've had detailed discussions with Welsh Government about what we would need and when. And again, maybe Mr Nichols can say a little bit more if you need that, but um, essentially, Peter, it's about having enough uh, resources to do the job now. We have the facility to increase them quickly if we need them, and obviously then uh, if we if we need to recruit more, we will we will do that. OK, Martin, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, I think if I remember rightly, it's 12, 13 people per team, just to give you the context. That's around about 48, 50 people currently redeployed into those areas. And that's uh, effectively covering uh, slightly reduced hours than was originally set up. So nine till five, seven days a week. Um, the, we have advertised externally for resources and had a large amount of interest. We haven't actually appointed any external staff yet, whilst we have the surplus capacity internally through redeployment. But it is a case of managing that transition, particularly linked to the shielded discussion that the leader mentioned earlier, gearing towards potentially the 16th of August, that as some of those services reopen and those staff go back, uh, both in terms of shielding and TTP staff, that you bring in the external appointed staff uh, on a phased basis. We are required to do that, to demonstrate the Welsh Government that we are only recruiting where we can't cover that role internally, because that's one of the conditions of the funding. Um, it will be uh, obviously uh, an ongoing process to be able to monitor the demand against the number of staff we employ. Um, and as you've seen in, in some parts of the UK, there can be spikes. That means you would very quickly have to ramp up those resources so the idea is we would look to try and bring people back in as and when necessary from an, an internal redeployment to try and manage those peaks. And we're also working with Neath Patalbert, and we've agreed that we would share the resources. So whilst we're employing and they are also employing their own cohort, we've agreed that if there was a spike in any one of the two areas, we will then cross subsidise with those resources. Uh, and as the leader mentioned earlier, we helped out North Wales when they had a spike. Uh, and all of the health board regions across Wales have agreed that if there is a disproportionate amount of cases in any one particular area, that other authorities would step in and help take some of that volume to even out any of the peaks, which will help us all, rather than uh, employing up to the maximum likely numbers. We're, we're a much lower threshold, but with some capability and capacity from elsewhere in the region and Wales. Thank you, Martin. And Phil Roberts? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just for the for the information for the committee, we've been given an indicative allocation of just over six million pounds until the end of March as a region. Uh, but 
you have to distinguish between what different people do within the contact tracing teams. So there is the conventional stuff that people refer to, which is almost like a call centre, contact centre type operation. But there's also a specialist element to the training, which has meant the diversion of some of our environmental health staff into public protection on, for the COVID pandemic. So there's a degree again to which we are juggling with the management of existing public protection services. I think the reassurance we can give the committee is now we've had this indicative allocation from Welsh Government, uh, as soon as we can, we'll return as many people to normal service as possible and substitute them with external staff. In fairness, to get this up and running, if you remember, we had two whole weeks to get this up and running even before the ICT system was ready. Uh, and in fairness, it wouldn't have been rational or possible to do that via an external recruitment process. So we, we were always going to have to recruit internal staff. Now we've got a reassurance over funding. Uh, I think we'll be able to return those members of staff more quickly, which is a, a, a relief. OK, thanks for that. I'm going to move on to recovery planning now. Um, Chris Holly, you want to come in and start off this one? Yeah, th thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Leader. Um, obviously, with the, the recovery plan and, and having seen what's happening in other parts of the UK, um, obviously the the um, emphasis in some parts has been about the recovery for um, the employment and also for city centre recovery. Uh, have we got a shape to what we want our recovery plan to look like? And if we have, obviously it's an ongoing issue because um, it depends on what the Welsh Government decide to unlock or what the, um, the social distancing and all that goes to them. But have we a shape to how our recovery plan will look like? And um, obviously, you know, as some indicative timelines to when we can have a look at that. Yes, yeah, certainly, Chris. So, I mean, it's at it's at multiple levels at the moment. So if I if I just break it down, uh, Welsh <laughs> Government are, are, are launching their recovery plan, you know, the Build Back Better. But within that, uh, Ken Skate has been clear, there are four key areas. So there's people, place, digital and green. Those are the, the areas that Welsh Government will focus on, um, again, in terms of supporting uh, or trying to um, give support to a public sector led uh, recovery uh, of the economy. And again, within that, you'll know that there are city deal projects. There are the major developments in the city centre, as other councils will have in their areas. Um, there is stuff that we can do, obviously, um, subject to, uh, you know, a new proposal coming or a revised proposal coming forward. We'd, we'd, we'd perhaps like to see the Tidal Lagoon in there as well, perhaps, or a Tidal Lagoon in there. So there are a number of aspects that are at a national level. At the regional level, obviously, we're working to make sure that our regional plan aligns to the national plan. And, of course, the four councils are all doing recovery planning uh, in terms of how they can participate in that. We've got very good, as you, as you, as you will know, very good relationship on economic development across the region already, uh, which has been in for a number of years. So it's, it's about bringing a lot of that together. There's, there's quite a lot of work going on uh, around the metro and transport proposals because uh, that work was well advanced. So again, part of the messaging through the, the discussions we're having with Welsh Government is, is actually, you know, you have a lot of projects or a lot of initiatives already, either in trail or, or ready for approval. So, you know, you could start, if you want to start a, a really significant recovery, then sign off and approve a number of those projects and let's get them underway. So that, that's part of it. In terms of our focus in-house, Chris, it's um, the three elements to it. You know, you, you'll have seen the themes on the, on the slides that we put up earlier. But in terms of our organisation, we've got obviously the, the internal recovery plan, which really covers the next sort of 18 months. We obviously have our financial management to deal with, and that, that will take care of where we are with this year's budget and next year's budget and obviously looking at what we get back, the stuff we've talked about around making sure that we get what we do back from Welsh Government and elsewhere. And then, as I said, we have that longer term planning, which we need to account for as well, which is around the replacement for sustainable Swansea fit for the future. So, as I said, it, it, it's there, there's a number of plans being developed at the moment and, they, and what we're trying to do is to align them to make sure that we have the best chance of giving a coherent um, you know, recovery for this region and for this city. So um, what you'll see is, uh, you know, our schools rebuilding program hasn't stopped in, in, in Swansea during the pandemic, as it has in a number of other councils. 
you know, a number of our school bills are all have, have, have mar- moved ahead really quickly. And of course, we announced a few more kicking off in terms of Greer and uh, uh, a couple of other schools this week, uh, Tanalan. Uh, in the city centre, you'll know the arena project has moved ahead. A number of the private schemes have moved ahead. Um, but there are more on the horizon and are, and are sitting, some of them are sitting with the ministers in Cardiff at the moment in London for consideration. So I think there's a, there's a lot there. And then finally, Chris, not to repeat too much, but of course, we're supporting the reopening anyway. So a number of bits of the plan are already being put in place. So schools reopening, social services reopening, um, uh, our place-based services reopening and supporting businesses in the city centre to to open as best they can, given that there are still restrictions in place. So, you know, again, I pay tribute to the work that's being done by licensing planning, uh, city centre managers and our environmental health to to help guide and, and advise people to get their businesses open safely. You should have a you should have a set of slides on it, Chris, probably for the next um, uh, scrutiny meeting, probably in a month's time. OK, um... Obviously, the medium-term financial plan is, is going to have to adopt, adapt now because of COVID and, and various other uh, issues as well. But I am interested in the fact that um, you said about the, the investment uh, from Welsh Government and UK Government being, you know, forget about the, uh, the lagoon for a moment, but let's consider all the other prospects of it. But one thing is, we, you know, the... the we say about investment from the private sector, but I'm not sure where that's going to come at the moment because there is huge problems within in the private sector. But one thing I am interested in is that we are pushing ahead with some of our projects. But can can you so the shape say in the shape is going to be around following the 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 Welsh. Um, what, what Ken Skates has put out recently about that development. But one of the things that I'm interested in is how much are we going to get or how much are we going to push for infrastructure um, investment, whereas the rest of the UK, including uh, the devolved, uh, devolved governments, seem to be lacking in the, the money that the UK government is pushing into infrastructure in England. Are we pushing for any of that? And what's the Welsh government's view on that infrastructure? Because that's actually very important when you consider the Southwest Wales, uh, South East Wales Metro project is is taking shape now. They start in work in the, the valley lines. So I, one thing I, I would like to know is how much uh, the UK gov- of the Welsh government pushing the UK government for that infrastructure development, because that's really what we need here more than anything else. Yeah, absolutely, Chris. And uh, look, we're pushing on all fronts. Um, I agree with you that um, you know in- infrastructure investment and, and big uh, projects need to proceed really quickly. Um, what we've done is under that four strands, if you like, for Ken Skates, you've got Jeremy Miles doing the overall arching recovery approach as well with Welsh Government taking into account how we prepare for Brexit as well, because, of course, Brexit hasn't gone away and we could still face a cliff edge uh, come the end of the year. Um, So all of that planning is being done. What we've done through the WLGA is provide 10 themes, themed areas where we believe uh, Welsh Government and UK Government could invest in the economy across Wales. And in each of those, Swansea Council has provided a number of schemes that we have, um, which we believe are shovel ready or could be deployed very quickly. A lot of them infrastructure schemes uh, to enable us to stimulate the economy. So that list has been provided. It's gone into the mix with uh, Welsh Government and WLJ. We won't really know the quantum of it um, until Rebecca or the relevant minister in Welsh Government announces uh, the recovery uh, programme itself. One thing I do know is Welsh Government were incredibly disappointed with the consequential that came from the announcements in UK government because um, again I think England itself was uh, disappointed with it with what it actually turned out to be but the consequentials for Wales are are not significant so again we we are working with Welsh government to see um, where we can best place the money that the Welsh government has and, and any consequential it does get from UK government to, to take those projects forward what I would say as well is, of course, we're also pushing, and I spoke to David Davis last week about it, the Shared Prosperity Fund that is due to come. That has been promised a number of times. We still don't know how big that will be, what the mechanism is for, for providing cash. But, you know, we've been very clear. We want to work with the UK government on that. 
uh, to ensure that money that could come from the Shared Prosperity Fund comes into Wales uh, so that we get, it can be deployed by the Welsh Government, possibly to the regions, uh, to get projects off the ground quickly. On that last point, uh, uh, Rob, um, the Shared Prosperity Fund, because the quantum isn't yet known and a consequential uh, and the way it's going to be spread, can, when you have, or when we have a view on that, or when the council has a view on it, is it possible that you let us know with, straight away? Because politically, and I know this is a scrutiny board, and it shouldn't be said, but politically, that's of a huge significance with Brexit uh, happening next next January. Yeah, and as you know, we we've we've made it clear that Wales should not be a penny worse off. Um, we still don't know what the, the quantum is, and I'd welcome the scrutiny board support in lobbying uh, UK government for getting those answers as quickly as possible because the clock is ticking. And, you know, the last thing anybody needs in this country at the moment is a no deal Brexit on top of a COVID crisis. It would be an absolute killer for the economy across the UK. Correct. I think that might be a bit optimistic, Rob, but there we are. Uh, Terry yeah. Hennigan. <laughs> Terry, you yes, to... I uh, got, got to mute it back up on that. Um, I'd like to say to Rob, we've had some good news regarding the education and the schools this last couple of weeks, especially the new one that's coming up. In, is it uh, Tanalan in, in place? Yeah. Uh, but on a personal note, I would like to come and meet with yourself and the cabinet member for education to discuss some of the other issues regarding the education and schools. Very happy to, Terry, if you, if you, um, no problem at all, you know, I'm very happy to meet any members who want to discuss uh, about education in their areas. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Mike White, you've got a question? Is he here? He was here. He's in the Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I've got two questions, leader, I'd like to uh, ask you about. Uh, uh, in yeah. regards to the... Uh, the amount of businesses have actually now started up um, in the city centre. Have you any idea of the percentage of what uh, businesses are actually operating? I know we've got a tremendous working relationship with the with the bed and the traders. Just an idea how, how far we are off from perhaps getting back to normality. And the second point, leader, is regarding to the issue of public transport and getting that up and running. As you know, uh, People that were made aware that the quadrant opened last Sunday, but clearly we still operate, are operating on a limited service, uh, which is obviously proving very difficult for bus passengers because on certain routes, because they're only allowing nine passengers on a single decker bus and 18 on a double decker bus. Give you an example if you travel in Route 36 from Morrison in the city centre via uh, Brynavred, Manselton. By the time the bus is at Brynavred, it is going through as, uh, as full. So then there's an issue there with the, um, of people having to wait longer. And, and my concern is as well, is that especially when people now are going back to work, uh, have we got any, uh, any sort of way further with first bus on them actually um, I know it's the issue with social distancing, but even if they could increase the number of buses that they are putting on the routes, because at the moment a lot of work are only operating at two an hour. Uh, can you let me know on that, please? Yes, yeah, cer certainly. Thanks for that, Mike. Um, so uh, at the moment, the best information I have from the city centre team is that, and from Bid is that we've seen around 90% of the businesses um, uh, open with some still to go. So um, again, most of the businesses in the city centre are now open. In the market, around 80 out of the 100 stalls are uh, open and operating, which is really good. Footfall um, in the city centre was around uh, 33,000, which was up 3,000 on the previous week. Um, but again, a number of stores like M&S and Debenhams reported their best openings across Wales in Swansea. So that was really uh, positive. And, uh, and whilst hospitality businesses are able to open at the moment and we're supporting them to open into outside spaces, um, nearly three quarters are, are, have chosen to remain closed until they're able to open inside. 
Um, various reasons for that, because for a lot of them, it still isn't economical to open if they only got the outside space. So again, most of those we think will be ready to reopen now on the 3rd of August, if the Welsh Government uh, uh, permit that when we get to that review point. Um, again, we're working really closely with BID, uh, as you say, and again, you know, we, we're continuing with uh, assistance for the city centre. But I should say that, you know, it doesn't stop at the city centre. Myself, Councillor Robert Francis Davis, Councillor David Hopkins, I've had um, discussions with business uh, businesses in Mumbles, in Uplands, in Gosainan, uh, in, uh, in areas across Swansea. And what we're trying to do is to make sure that businesses get a chance to ask questions. We're then putting them in touch with our relevant officers so they can support them to reopen safely. So it's, it's not just a city centre. I think we're getting a, a healthy and safe opening across the, across the city, which is really good. In terms of the um, uh, the transport situation, obviously, the, the point you make quite rightly about the numbers of people on buses will change, no doubt, because of the Welsh Government announcement of face masks yesterday. But as of um, the information I had at the beginning of the week, um, First Cymru are currently operating around 45% of the network, but they're only carrying about 20% of their normal passenger numbers. Uh, and again, um, you know, <clears throat> as things come back online, that could step up to around 60% of the network. Um, but again, it'll be difficult to get 100% unless we get, um, obviously, the, the, the sorts of announcements that Welsh Government made yesterday. So, you know, Welsh Government have, have said that you now have mandatory masks uh, for public transport. And of course, um, mandatory masks are there in, where you can't observe two metre social distance in all occasions. So I think it's a reflection of the fact that both in Wales, England and the other home nations, you know, the the masks are becoming uh, more of a uh, usage rather than the, the strict two metre distancing that we had in the early part of the, the coronavirus uh, position. So, again, I don't know whether Martin wants to add anything to what I said, but I think that, that, that covers your questions, Mike, I think. Yes, thank you, Lida. It's just, it's just that I've, had, I've certainly had queries, uh, especially with the, with, with the transport issue. Okay. Do Martin want to come in at all, or are you happy, Martin? Yeah, just, just to add one point, we, we know there is, you know, whilst we're having discussions with FIRST on the local services, we know there is direct dialogue taking place between Welsh Government and all providers to try and come up with a sustainable model over the medium to longer term. Uh, so they are looking at how they're funding the bus companies, um, you know, just to make sure that they are both financially viable plus operate in the level of service that, as you rightly say, Mike, uh, we, we need to have to be able to allow the, the, allow the economy and other people to get back to work and travel around normally. So that is a challenge we know Welsh Government are also trying to address as well. OK, uh, Peter Jones has a more philosophical question on the uh, on the pandemic. Peter? Oh. Is he there? Hello? Hello, I can hear you, Peter. I'm just wondering which of my two planned questions comes under your heading of philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> well, the second one was asylum seeker. So the first one, I think, on the on the uh, the next steps. On the next steps. Well, the the, the um, you you got a question about um, oh, I've lost it now, about the research based that the pandemic may not may not ah. be the the end the end. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And um, thank you, chair. Um, and some might think this is a premature question. Some will certainly think it's a somewhat pessimistic question and issue, um, but I think it's something that requires discussion and debate, and that is that you know, there, there's a tendency in public discussion, perhaps not in this meeting, to uh, tend to think of COVID-19 in terms of being a short-term, whatever, however we define short-term, but a short-term crisis, that there's going to be a beginning, a middle and an end, and once we reach the end, life will return back to normal, we shall have a wonderful a serviceable vaccine, we should all have built up our antibodies uh, and all is going to be well and normality, whatever we think about normality, is going to resume uh, going forward. Um, but of course the World Health Organization and other bodies, uh, bodies here in the United Kingdom, are suggesting that this rosy outcome isn't perhaps as likely as we would all like to uh, expect and believe. And indeed some would have seen the reports today that the WHO are predicting possibly a a further 120,000 deaths going forward into uh, next year in the United Kingdom uh, alone. Um, so we have to think about the potential of COVID 
being endemic, much in the way as common cold and uh, what we call influenza uh, have become endemic and we've had to learn to live with them as best we can. We have a certain number of cases each year, but we don't disrupt the entire economy in order to cope with them. And the issue therefore is, are we prepared as a society, an economy and a culture to, to live with this possible consequence that we might be living for years, not months or even a year, but for years ahead. And in terms of the council, I mean, we've been hearing how resources have been redeployed to enable us to cope with the matter here at the present time. It's been very uh, impressive, it's wonderful, and the council will be congratulated for it. But if we're going to have to cope with repeated troughs and peaks going forward year after year after year, perhaps particularly over the winter months of, however you define that, December through to May or June each year, then clearly we're going to have a council think about uh, a considerable permanent redeployment of resources, staff, service provision, and so on. Um, and I'm sure this is being thought about. Uh, we've already heard from the leader and from the chief executive references to the need to be prepared for peaks going forward into the next year or two. But are we beginning to think um, about the longer term? Uh, because what this COVID, on, an ongoing COVID is going to mean would be almost a kind of a permanent change in the way that we, redeploy, we deploy our resources going forward uh, in order to ensure that we can meet all our service commitments whilst also coping with this possibly permanent or semi-permanent COVID task. Clearly this is a task for the NHS too. Wonderful that we've got our overflow hospital, which I suspect may be needed sometime next year. And we'll be glad that we made the provision for it. Um, but how are we giving any thought or will we be giving any thought to this longer term implication of a permanent change that COVID may bring about? Sorry for that rambling approach, but thank you. We welcome comments, please. Thank you. No, Peter, I think it, you make a very important point there. I mean, look, um, Yes, it is being considered uh, in terms of this may not be something that uh, goes away after a few months, uh, because again, you know, the, the evidence uh, um, you know, or the, the modeling from uh, people like WHO is that, you know, there, there are potentially three or four ways out of this, aren't there? One is that we find a vaccine. Well, they didn't, they haven't yet found a vaccine for many of the other potential pandemics that, that have occurred over the recent uh, years. Um, and I don't believe they've ever found a coronavirus vaccine at present, but there's a there's a huge global effect going into it. So you wouldn't say that they absolutely can't find one. Obviously, the virus itself may become as it mutates and it has mutated more than 30 times already from what we understand. May become less lethal. It may change the way in which it transmits. All of those things are, are things that could impact how we then deal with the virus. Because again, if it becomes something that you catch, but you don't necessarily uh, uh, die from, then obviously it changes the approach. Um, and of course, the, the third thing that could happen is that we could develop, uh, you know, treatments for this rather than a vaccine. So again, in the same way that you may then accept that there's some risk there, but people get treated with it and learn to live with it. Um, I think what you're asking, though, Peter, is it, subject to all of those not being the case um, and that we have the ongoing sort of virus that we have at the moment with the same sort of risks, then, yeah. of course, we will still need to keep those extra services running. Uh, and I guess, you know, if you look at all of the countries, we're on a trajectory to reopen as best we can our economy. And then it looks like it'll be more of a tactical close down um, of areas of the economy or areas of the country if peaks arise. And I think that will be become potentially if we don't get the other sort of developments I talked about, uh, that will become, if you like, part of the new norm. And of course, ways of us behaving in that new norm will, will depend on what we're able to do and how the virus behaves. What I would say, though, is, of course, the response that a lot of countries took in the early days of this pandemic were to protect their health services from becoming overwhelmed. Because that was about saying, if you got too many people becoming too ill uh, and needing that intensive care at the same time, then our health service and most other health services would not have been able to cope with the numbers of people. And what we wanted to avoid, obviously, was a triage situation where you had to refuse certain people the, the medical treatment that you would want to give them. So I think in, in 
in terms of where we are as a country now, where most of the health services in Europe are, they're better prepared to deal with the second wave. And I can't say that they're entirely prepared. That's something health will have to answer, but they're bet much better prepared than they were. We're much more aware of the virus. And of course, I think our response therefore will be different in, in the coming months. I mean, I hope that either a vaccine or a treatment or the, or the um, virus dissipates in the coming years. I mean, if you look at previous pandemics, they have had one or two peaks and then they've, they've dissipated. <coughs> Um, so we, we, we hope that that's the case, but it's no, by no means guaranteed and you're right to raise it, but it's certainly in our thinking, Peter. Thank you. Uh, I don't think they ever found a, a, a vaccine for Spanish flu, did they? No, <laughs> but, no. no. Uh, uh, Chief Executive, she wants to come in. Yeah, just a couple of points from me, Chair. I think um, Councillor Jones's question is a good one and anyone would be foolish not to be thinking about it. And there's a couple of things, to re really. The first is um, the... The whole, I don't want to underplay the issue, but the whole issue has become overwhelming in terms of the public and the media. Uh, and the danger with that is it, uh, it, it then gets a disproportionate response. Uh, so I mentioned last scrutiny meeting that, that there were concerns about some urgent uh, diagnostic elective uh, surgery at um, our hospitals. And, and everything needs to be put into a balance. But when you don't understand the degree of the crisis, and we still don't, and let's be quite honest, with it, you'll still find different scientific opinion about when second and third peaks will occur, the severity of the winter flu crisis. Um, we do need to get a perspective and to be able to balance the decisions that have been made. Part of it is in, in relation to health, part of it is in relation to general well-being, social, and economic factors, the mental health of the population. Uh, and it's very difficult when you're in the crisis mode to rationally uh, think about that. And for politicians, I suspect it's one of the most difficult things you can do because you've got to weigh the urgent against the, the, the long-term rational. I do think there are two principles that I, that I think um, we are taking away from this from an organisational point of view. The first is about resilience uh, and it's about how rapidly we were able to at least get an operation running um, the minute lockdown happened. Um, so there was in that, have you got the infrastructure as an organisation, technically so on and so forth, to be able to operate in that environment? I'm pleased to say we pretty much had, it's improved. You can see nine of you now instead of four of you. Uh, you know, there are things about um, regional, um, and intergovernmental working that have been massive improvements. So that's the first. The second principle uh, above resilience for me is flexibility. And what our workforce has demonstrated is absolute flexibility. Councils are not uh, reputationally famous for being um, inflexible, organize flexible organisations. They tend to be um, quite dyed in the wool um, slightly traditional structures uh, and we need to think about that from a workforce perspective and how quickly we can mobilize people because we you know on the one on the one hand you can say things were planned okay on the other hand if it hadn't been for the flexibility of the staff and the speed at which all of those people uh, adapted their working lives we would not have been able to respond properly so if we don't uh, Councillor Jones, take away uh, resilience and flexibility from this, I think we're in trouble. And, and I, for one, I'm not a scientist. I read as much as everyone else. Um, I'm, I'm none the wiser, but I do suspect that this is far from, we're far from out of the woods uh, on this particular one, and we're not talking weeks and months. Um, you know, it's going to change the fabric of society for longer than that. Um, so we need, in that sense, I think is the point you're making, we need to learn to live with it, Chair. Yes, thank, thank you, Harris. May very quickly, I mean, if we just take the example, say, of staffing our library services across the city, um, and they have had to close for the duration, uh, and we're still not clear about the reopening. And um, similarly, maybe the cultural services and so on. If we're going to face a repeated process, again and again and again, perhaps, of having to redeploy staff out of what we might call the non-essential activities in order to uh, support uh, social care, health and so forth. We may be finding as a council, as an organisation, that repeatedly we're having to close down sectors of our activities in order to meet this requirement. 
Um, and that really puts a pressure on us that um, in terms of resource allocation, we have to ask ourselves, are there certain functions we may, may no longer be able to support because of COVID? So thank you. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, Will Thomas, did you want to come in on your question now? Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. I mean, it's it's largely been answered by um, the leader, uh, Chief Exec and Martin. It was basically on uh, preparations for uh, for a second wave. Um, so I, I think that's largely largely been been covered, really, especially as uh, Martin's point about you know collaboration with other councils and things, which I think is very positive. So uh, no, I think that's been covered. Thank you. Okay, uh, Peter, do you want to come on your question on asylum seekers? I'm not very good at unmuting. Ah, oh, there we are. Right, yes. <laughs> um, I know I've raised the issue of asylum seekers before, but I make no apology for doing so again. I mean, we are, and rightly and proudly, a city of sanctuary for asylum seekers, for refugees from many parts of the world, parts of the world affected by war, by disease, uh, and so forth. Um, and of course, we've got, I'm told, anything up to a thousand uh, asylum seekers stroke refugees currently resident in Swansea and of course the problem for the asylum seekers is that they have a very restricted income I believe it's only 35 pounds per week um, they're not allowed to work um, they're not entitled to any forms of uh, public financial support other than the 35 pounds per week now this is meant I know for Certainly a the food bank with which I'm involved, but I'm sure it relates or applies also to many other food banks across the city, that our asylum seekers are scattered, as I've discovered, all over Swansea. Indeed, I visited parts of Swansea I didn't even know existed as a result of meeting uh, and supporting some of our asylum seekers. Um, because they've got so little money, they cannot afford the bus fares or whatever it might be to travel to a food bank so the food banks have to send the stuff out, not just food, but other stuff for children and so on, to them. And the point that's been raised with me, therefore, and I know that this is not a, a, an issue that the council itself can necessarily answer, um, but a huge difference would be made to the lives of asylum seekers if they had free bus travel, uh, if they had some kind, had some kind of system uh, that operates uh, for over 60s across the city. Now, I don't know whether it's possible for uh, the, the, the council to make some provision of that kind. It may not be. It may infringe the, the legal restraints that appear to be imposed on the financial support that can be given to asylum seekers. But it would make an enormous difference to the lives of these people if they had the facility to travel around. And it would also take some of the pressure off food banks having to go to them, as I know I do every week and others do every week, uh, to provide them with the food and essentials that they don't have the means to travel to get or pay for indeed themselves. I'm just wondering therefore, is there anything the council can do to enable the free use of public transport in Swansea or failing that? And I suspect the answer probably is no, but if it, if it is no, can we at least join the mounting lobby on the Welsh Government, on the UK Government in Westminster to do something about this and recognise that this is an uh, something that needs to change. These people are desperate situations and why we shouldn't be making their situation even more desperate. I welcome any comments. Thank you. Leader. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Peter. Look, I fully support what you're saying. And obviously we've been advocates uh, as part of our city of sanctuary activities uh, for a better deal for asylum seekers or refugees. Um, and, you know, we, we have issues in terms of the how the UK government policy applies to to um, refugees and asylum seekers in the UK. So I'm um, very happy to, to join that chorus, as you say. In terms of the mechanics on the ground, um, whilst, of course, um, ideally it would be for the UK government or Welsh government to provide that help if it possibly could, because there are strict controls over, as you quite rightly say, in terms of help that can be provided to refugees and asylum seekers and uh, the things they're allowed to own, the amount of money that they're allowed to own, or any, any money at all that they're allowed to have. So. It is a really difficult process. And obviously, when we were providing uh, free school meals um, to uh, asylum seekers and, and to, to others during the um, during the coronavirus uh, phase, uh, obviously, that was a challenge for us in terms of trying to get a system in place that was lawful uh, under the UK government's rules. 
Um, what I would say on bus travel itself, I understand exactly the point you're making, and I do understand that that I would support that being resolved. What I would say, though, is I think we need to go back to what we were saying a bit earlier around actually the way in terms of our our, our own public transport is structured in Wales, because in far too many places you have a private sector monopoly where Welsh government mm. are, and ourselves are funding that, where operators can remove unprofitable routes at a, a very short notice, leaving communities unserved. Um, I've advocated for us to take a bigger um, uh, active role within providing transport in Swansea or regionally. The onset of the metro allows us to do that. And, and again, the work that's going on with Welsh Government at the moment, not only to prepare to, to look at how we could step in if, if uh, a private sector a transport provider failed, but also what we would want as a as a transport system in Wales longer term. I'm very keen for us to be the runner, the operator of services in the city, which would give us the control to make steps and to, and to take action in the way that you suggest to support um, asylum seekers or refugees. But I want to do that so that everybody benefits, so that we don't have a bus business, we have a bus service in Swansea that runs to communities at all hours of the day and night and doesn't leave communities isolated and people unable to travel after 6 p.m. at night. Yeah, thank you very much. I fully agree with that. Thank you, Joe, our leader. Okay, has anybody got any more questions you want to ask at this stage? No? Okay, I think that's uh, that, that's we've covered virtually the whole range. Thank can I thank uh, uh, Rob and Phil Roberts and Martin Nichols for coming along and, and answering the questions. Uh, the committee will put together a letter um, um, by email most probably which we'll send to you later on just to cover what we've covered here so thanks again rob and and and, and phil and martin for coming on and, and making a contribution very much appreciated the, you, um, thank you chair the, problem, the next meeting of the committee is going to be um tuesday the 18th of august at four o'clock um you've also got the uh, dates of some panel meetings in August and September so hopefully we'll, we'll reconvene and, and we'll most probably continue to focus on the Covid crisis and the pandemic um, in August certainly and the recovery plan. I think we'll have more detail on the recovery plan by then as well so thank you everybody for attending and I I'm going to call the meeting to an end. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.